Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for our webinar on rethinking learning in the 21st century. Just wanted to let you know that this session is being recorded. My name is Shannon Donovan and I am your Oxford Learning Resource Consultant. Tonight we have with us well-known authors Gloria Latham and Karen Malone of our popular textbook Learning to Teach. This one here. <laughs> um, Gloria comes from a primary background and Karen from a secondary background. During this one hour webinar, they'll delve into the intricacies of teaching in the 21st century, what learning and teaching could look like in a world that is constantly changing and the opportunities and challenges that have arisen for pre-service teachers during these unprecedented times. There are four sections to this webinar and at the end of each section, there'll be an opportunity for questions facilitated by our publisher, Geraldine. On the floating panel on this screen is a speech bubble. It's the third from the right. You can ask your questions by clicking on this chat icon. Please ensure your microphone and video are off throughout the webinar and ask all your questions in the chat box. So without further ado, let's get into it. Gloria and Karen, over to you. Hello everyone, um, I'm Gloria and I just find these times amazingly interesting and I think um, Karen would agree with me, especially for education because we have such opportunities at this moment, even with all the challenges to change education, to make it fit much more ably into the 21st century. You know, um, Harari, a, a noted historian and uh, philosopher, believes that the 20, believes that pandemics thrust us into 10 years beyond our time. But they're not always 10 years that we, the 10 years we wanted to become but it is an opportunity for us to to make these changes. Um, Maslow said way long ago, in any movement, we have two options, to step forward into growth or to step back into safety. But I think today it's more than just being safe to turn back. I think it's about tradition has guided the way we do education for so long that it's really difficult to move beyond that. But I think the time is ripe right now for that to happen. Um, Noah uh, Harari believes that although we none of us can know what 2050 will be like, what we do know is that people will have to be lifelong learners, that they will have to have emotional intelligence and that they'll have to have great resilience. We've been using those words over and over um, to talk about these times. And yet I feel there's a lack of action on the part of schools to actually develop these dispositions or habits of mind as they're called. Um, Learning, um, the director of Real World Learning, Bill Lucas, advocates for dispositions over the skills that we teach. And he's listed a, a whole number for learners and the kind of person. And, and these dispositions are the way the character of the person takes on the problems that they encounter. And so he has ones like as a learner, practical, inquisitive, imaginative, craftsman-like, skeptical and collaborative, and the kind of person generous, forgiving, tolerant, trustworthy, morally brave, convivial, thoughtful, ecological, and I would add adventurous. But I'd also like to say that it's not just qualities for the students, it's qualities that I believe 
teachers need as well. And we don't talk about that enough either. Um, I wanted to take you back to position Karen and I in uh, where we come from and to take you back to 2005 and 2006 when we both worked at RMIT. It honestly was a pivotal time in my life, probably the happiest time in my career as an academic. Um, for two years, I felt like this lone voice advocating for um, discomfort. And I know that sounds probably strange, but I believe real learning happens when we're in a state of discomfort rather than comfortable. And of course, this pandemic has thrown us in, into that um, very much. And so during that time, when I talked to students about this area of discomfort, I talked about placing, having them place themselves in situations where they didn't know the answer and where they had to find new ways of thinking and being. When we're comfortable, we're often um, in our roles, we're, we're less open to new ideas. So I was guided by Will Richardson's Steep on Learning Curve, um, Megan Bowler's Pedagogy of Discomfort that's premised on the claim that experiences of discomfort can be used to invite students and educators to view the world um, that has been shaped um, by, the, by a dominant culture. And also Donna Haraway's need to stay with the trouble reconfiguring our relationship with the world and with other species. During this time, we had a Dean, Mary Colansis, who really wanted new learning to come to the fore. And we had um, a head of school who was really pushing us to, to look at new learning and ways to develop curriculum in the um, Bachelor of Education program at that time. And she, they brought in speakers like Michael Apple, who talked to staff about education being ethical and political. And our head of school, Nicola Yellen, brought in Colin Lancashire. And he talked about new learning and ways of seeing curriculum differently. And I was so inspired during that time. But as well, I had colleagues who were brought in. One was Julie Faulkner, who was already there with me. But Karen Malone, who's talking with me today, you came, as did Mindy Blaze. And these conversations, which I think are so incredibly important to have at this time, were shared by us. We went away together often and we talked. And although we came from entirely different disciplines, what we had in common was a belief that education wasn't keeping up with what was going on in the 21st century. Um, I understood. Um, that when students went out to schools and had their placement, they seldom believed what we said in at the university because what they were seeing was the same schools that they had attended and the same practices. And so very little had shifted except um, tinkering around the edges of change. And so, of course, they, they didn't believe us. They didn't believe that change was needed. So Julie Faulkner and I had the idea of creating a virtual school. And we called it Ladner Primary. And this could allow several things. One is all the students who had a placement at this school could be discussing the same school and the same teachers and the same children, which very seldom um, is allowed to happen. But as well, this school was making systemic changes because the school was failing. It, um, it was undergoing um, 
it could have folded because its performance levels were really down. So um, the, the media group at RMIT helped us create this school with lots of discomfort happening where things appeared that they didn't understand, where staff were struggling with new ways to implement things. But again, the staff they brought in uh, were people committed to change and to real change that, that would work in the school. Um, in the virtual school, they learned about it. There was a school in threat of closure, as I said, dwindling enrollments, low scores, standardized tests, a principal ready to retire because he couldn't see the point, children who were disgruntled and really didn't want to be in school. And um, this school framed the, the first book, Learning to Teach because we took the ideas that we put into this school and with students experiencing these things and um, created that school. It was um, Julie, Mindy and Joe Lang were, and they were constantly challenging me, I know, to think differently and to talk about new learning. Now we've just completed the third edition of Learning to Teach with no knowledge about a pandemic or what we would be facing at this time, but with the knowledge about um, that not a great deal had changed in all of that time and that we were ready um, to take on a very new edition of the book. And Karen, I wonder if you discuss a little bit about the student-led protest and how they framed that third edition. Yeah, and welcome everyone to the to the webinar and thanks Gloria for the start. And I want to make a shout out for Shelley Dole. I think you missed out Shelley and she was an amazing um, colleague of ours who worked along with us too. And and as Gloria says, it was a really interesting time. People sort of coming from all around the world from different areas coming together with a real um, sense that it was time to really disrupt what was going on in this very um, you know, traditional notion and mainstream way of, of school. And in fact, uh, probably the most um, difficult parts of it was that, as you said, Gloria, the students coming back from placements and saying, you know, you tell us all these great things we can do, but we get there and it doesn't look like that, you know, what can we do? And I remember at the time thinking that, you know, there was a lot of change fatigue. Teachers were feeling overwhelmed. They'd had lots of restructuring. A lot of teachers had been sacked around that time. It was when Jeff Kennett was coming in with these sort of golden you know knife and and really cutting away some of the really great things that were going on and not in supporting that but i suppose one of the things that was really important to us when we started to write the book was to go back to the real basic questions of like you know what is the purpose of schooling and has the purpose of schools and education changed you know since it was invented you know two centuries ago and um, and I think there's there's a lot of evidence to say if you walked into a classroom two centuries ago and you walked into one now you wouldn't you'd know what it was and you certainly wouldn't know that see a lot of difference bar maybe the computers um, but one of those questions when you ask about what is the role of school of course brings us back to this notion that schools are there um, to to create our humanness that is we become human through the schooling process you know we go we move from being uncultured possibly more animal-like uncivilized um, as children and through the schooling process we're socialized into our humanness and so it's been very much framed around the idea of being the human project to produce certain types of humans um, and of course, to be able to manage that process 
um, the idea of containing school within four walls with a certain structure, with a certain way of developing it through curriculum that can be you know, uh, managed by governments and so forth, has meant that you know, the practicalities of schooling haven't changed much. And in fact, even though we've seen a lot of shifts in theory and pedagogy, you know, there have been small shifts and change, no real radical rethinking of what a school would be. So that was sort of our fundamental beginning. And I think throughout the editions from one through to this final edition now, we've continued to keep searching for possibilities of where that revolution might happen in rethinking schools. So one of the things we're coming up to doing the third edition, of course, is that we started to write it just at the time when Greta Thunberg arrived and created you know, the notion of the demonstration, students leading protests at, you know, through um, platforms of social media and young people being willing to speak out about their worlds. And one of the questions I raised at the end of the of chapter two in this new edition um, around the school strikes is, um, if childhoods become an assemblage for political and ecological activism, how will educators respond to that? Um, and some instances, I went to all the strikes in, in Melbourne and I remember sitting on a tram and there was a couple of teenagers next to me and they were full in full school uniform. And I asked them, you know, why are you wearing a school uniform? And I remember the student saying to me, she said, because they wanted to make a stand to show the world that school children were having to do the labor of activism because adults didn't. And it was interesting, this idea that they wanted to show adults um, and they didn't want to be mistaken for adults or even be seen as puppets of adults. And they were very clear that they wanted to to be showing that they were moving out of the borders of schools to make this protest. So they were educating us. And I remember um, the adults on the marches on the streets, you know, broadcasting around, you know, what whether this was the right thing to do. And in fact, even our own prime minister at the time, who was very indifferent to the idea of children going out and protesting on the streets, and at one stage he made a statement, he, says, he said, each day I sent my kids to school and I know other members' kids should go also, also go to school, but we do not support our schools being turned into parliaments, which is interesting. Um, what we want is more learning in schools and less activism. So it, it's those sorts of statements that went into the public domain, I think, that really stimulated us to go, this is a time of action that we need to take up. And in the third edition, I think we, we rev up the, uh, the dynamism around how we can re-theorise schooling. Are there any questions? At, um, before we sort of move on to the second stage of the discussion where we're going to talk a little bit about um, the shifting landscape into um, thinking about COVID. Thanks, Karen and Gloria. So far we haven't had any questions, but we'd love to hear from any of our audience members. So perhaps if you want to go on to the next one and then we'll gather questions as we go. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start off, and, and 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 Gloria, please, you know, jump in if you want to um, yeah. intervene and, and 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 add to this discussion. But of course, you know, as Gloria said, when we started um, this book, we were really thinking a lot more about activism and changing dynamics around the planet in terms of climate change, uh, because that was really the big social and, and critical issue that was going on at the time that young people particularly were engaging with through the social media. So, um, you know, so we do locate it in the very beginning around the notions of the Anthropocene and what the Anthropocene Anthropocene might do in terms of calling educators to consider new ways of thinking and acting um, within their classroom practices, but also, you know, how governments might adapt to changes um, and invent new ways of thinking about what education might do during these times. 
So, and what was really interesting about the new book, unlike um, the uh, original books, where it focused very much on pre-service teachers engaging uh, with the virtual classroom, which, as I must say, Gloria, and I've never said this to you, but if I could have your virtual classroom up and running now during these stressful times of trying to find placements for my students at Swinburne, it would be such a great thing. But we don't have it anymore, which is uh, which is a shame because it would have been fabulous right now. Um, but in this book, we actually created, uh, we followed the stories of three pre-service teachers and we invite them to actually share with us their experience of um, of being um, in inhabiting different spaces in schools. And so we use a journal to explore those ideas. Um, but we considered what it might be like to think about learning um, that's no longer mainstream, but also considers the notions of post-anthropocentric pedagogies. And in fact, um, in the first two chapters, I frame some of this around the idea of the post-human. And the post-human builds on some of the work of, um, you know, uh, Donna Haraway's work around disruption, but also the notion of entanglement and relational ontologies. Um, I use the notion of post-human that's often presented by um, a colleague, Nathan Snazer, who talks about the idea that um, to be human and not animal is to be educated, but also to consider that education within a philosophical landscape opens up questions about what it means to be human. And then, of course, then what the role of education and fundamentally schools do in terms of defining what it means to be human. And the reason why where we start the book with that sort of notion and open it up into that space is because we do talk about um, that um, that understanding what it means to be human in a, in a world where relations and um, the ecosystems of the planet, and I'm talking ecosystems in a broad sense, um, provide us opportunities to think about different ways to be not only with each other but with with the animals, the plants, and others that we share the planet with. And you know, and we talk a lot about the importance of whether or not schools are in a position to be able to do that. Um, so, Gloria, tell me a little bit too about um, that was sort of my theoretical framing. What's some of the other theoretical ideas um, you think in the book that uh, have helped us sort of frame it um, uh, differently? Well, I think the, the narrative of the three pre-service teachers, Karen, is certainly one of them. I, I feel like we take the, those three people through the whole of their education at um, at a university, but we show as well all the multi voices of their lecturers, their parents, um, their thoughts and feelings and anxieties. And at the end, so they apply for a position at that school. And at the end, they give statements about how graduating statements and a metaphor about how they've learned and, and what they've achieved. And the assignments even that we have provided in this third edition are challenging the very dispositions that we talked about rather than just researching an area, they really are calling upon a very, a much more um, individualized and creative approach to these assignments, which are also in the book. Mm. And I suppose um, one of the things that we continue to explore is, you know, how to imagine education systems that don't rely on the institution of the school. So the idea that a classroom becomes more than, um, you know, the four walls that we've constructed, you know, in this sort of architecture of the school. In the first chapter, I also explore the idea about, you know, are schools um, like the dinosaurs bad adapters? That is, you know, from an ecosystem, 
um, system perspective, you know, if a species fails to adapt, they become extinct. And, you know, we wonder, have schools become so specialised and so unable to adapt um, that they that they won't survive in, when vir environments change? Um, even slowly, but even when we see environments change very quickly. And I think that's where, you know, the conversation now leading into the idea of COVID is really interesting because in the book, I talk a lot about that, um, that we've failed uh, schools in terms of being adaptive and we've failed to create niches for ourselves that allow us to be um, able to respond to what's going on in the world. In fact, we've seen in many ways schools become less responsive to you know, the, the world around them and becoming more and more insular and more and more focused on things that often we, you know, as intellectuals have spoken about that seem less and less important you know, for people's everyday lives. That is, you know, when we talk just about, you know, test results, when we talk about children being, you know, able to produce certain types of, you know, generalised notions of what success is. Um, all of those things in a really um, changing world that's changing so very quickly, we wonder, are they the sorts of attributes that are going to be useful? for humans to adapt to that changing environment? And is education really providing those opportunities? So I'm really um, going to sort of finish it there in terms of this section, but I suppose now what we really want to go is, what did we learn from reading, from writing the book? And what is it about the book that would help us then think about what's been going on in terms of the COVID, um, you know, context or climate that we've been living in um, over the last, you know, six months. So are there any questions um, that have come up, Geraldine? Um, none have come up in the chat room yet, but I've got one that I'd like to ask. Um, yes, Gloria yeah. mentioned the fact that comfort makes us less open to new ideas. And I think that all of us are aware that at, during COVID, we've all had to grapple with discomfort and new ideas are coming out. How do you think educators could be, can use this time to try new things? I, if, I'll take a little start with this, Karen. I, I think yeah. that it's been an incredibly challenging time for teachers during this time. And as you, as you said, Geraldine, rightly so, that change has been thrust on them. They haven't had the choice of change. It's been thrust. But in doing so, I'm, I'm in a household with two teachers right now and two um, young children who are experiencing home learning. And both of them are talking about the opportunities the re rethinking of the things they've done in the past that had to be done has invigorated them. And many have talked about um, how much they're getting to know the children and the children's families that they would never have known before in, a, in um, the everyday classroom because there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one communication as they chat with them. So I think that the time has been incredibly challenging for them, but I do think many are seeing the possibilities. And the other thing that's happening is, is the respect for teachers, I think, has really grown because parents are recognizing some of the difficulties they're having in home learning and recognizing what teachers do every day with 24, 25 children. So again, I, I think it's that opportunity to not look at just the challenges or difficulties, but to look at the possibilities. And I think there are many. Mm. And I'm especially, I think it's interesting, um, you know, the sort of way that um, these 
different teaching and learning opportunities have been named. You know, people call it remote learning, on learning, yeah, online learning, it's flexible learning, it's homeschooling, you know. Uh, and it's sort of interesting. And I and I did sort of at one stage have a lot of discussions with others around this idea of calling it homeschooling, because is it really homeschooling? Because I know I, I have friends who homeschool and it's really a choice they make and they set up their, in, you know, their homes and their lives according to the idea that this is a choice they're making around what they'll do to support their children's learning. So when it's suddenly thrust upon people who've not made that choice, it, the choice has been made for them. I think it may, it becomes a very different thing. And I know um, many of my daughter's friends who've got children in you know, primary school uh, have often said to me, oh, I'm struggling to try and get through all the work that the, the kids are being given to do and I don't know how to help them. Um, you know, I'm really challenged by it. And they've asked me, you know, what can I do? Can you give me some ideas and tips, you know? And I think, you know, the more and more time went on, I think what people started to realise is that instead of trying to reproduce, so what happens when when change happens, you take what you did before and you try and put it into the change situation. So you don't adapt or reconstruct it. You sort of like, OK, we're no longer in the classroom, so we're going to do what we did in the classroom at home. So we set up synchronous teaching, we try and keep the worksheets going, we just get parents to come in and act as pseudo teachers and all the rest of it. But of course, you know, that's unrealistic. You're not in a classroom anymore. All the things that classrooms support and create are no longer really available. So what is it that we can do in this space that creates learning, you know, but maybe it's learning of a different type of learning. And I think over time we saw that happen. We saw um, teachers and parents coming together and having conversations around, well, what can we really do and, and what is possible? And also, you know, maybe we should ask the children how they're going and what they want and how it might look for them. And I think people started to relax a lot more about it. And I certainly saw a lot less anxiety with parents over time saying that they started to say, well, let's go for walks, let's ride bikes, let's cook bread, let's, you know, um, engage in, you know, building a vegetable garden, let's, you know, let's, let's see learning in a much broader way. And for me, that's the, um, that's the brilliance of COVID in a sense, is that suddenly learning becomes a whole lot of other things. And it's not just, you know, what I learn in my books, in a classroom, with my teacher, in very rigid, you know, sort of um, traditional ways. Um, and and from my side of it, you know, so we're moving into you know into the third part of the talking here. But you know, as a, a, a you know, you couldn't you couldn't uh, wish it upon you know your uh, your best friend. Uh, but I ended up being the dean, uh, you know, at this particular time at university. So it's like the worst time you could be asked to be asked to do it. But but also a very interesting time, I have to say, it's been incredibly challenging. But also I've learned so much because one of the things, you know, that's become very clear is we're not just talking about um, teachers and classrooms. Of course, that's part of it. And, and the pressure we've put on teachers to perform, change their practices quickly and respond, which they've done in amazing ways in short amounts of time, is that we also, of course, um, as a, in university, in our learning, um, learning to teach, you know, book, which is focuses, is the importance of the placement, the, you know, the pre-service teachers getting that opportunity to be in classrooms or work alongside a mentor um, to build experience so that they can graduate and become teachers themselves. Well, of course, COVID just tipped all of that on its head because um, schools were no longer there. The, the old practices and procedures and protocols for placements was gone. Um, teachers were feeling very anxious and, and concerned themselves about managing this new environment and weren't so keen to have students, you know, alongside of them. So the universities and many of the deans, you know, in Victoria, but all around Australia and I'm sure all around the world, 
have had to rethink, you know, how we can negotiate that relationship. What what would a pre-service teacher's placement look like in this new, you know, context? And um and it's been incredibly challenging. Some teachers have have seen it as a gift and said, this is fantastic. They're very skilled with technology. Bring it on. I'm happy to have them on board. Others have felt like um, it would be too much to try and incorporate, um, you know, bringing a, a pre-service teacher with them. And so there was a lot of confusion. There's been a lot of, um, you know, uh, unknowing around how to make this work. But I thought I'd just share with you, um, one of my staff members who normally works with the students um, in the classrooms, um, we asked her if she could do some checking in with pre-service teachers and, and their mentors to see how they were going in this online environment, so the ones that, that took it on. And what I found was really extraordinary is that um, what changed in those relationships was um, was the development of a very, very different relationship between the teachers and the pre-service teachers. So, um, you know, some of the feedback from the pre-service teachers saying it was incredible, it was the best placement I've ever had, I really felt like I was being recognised as a teacher, I felt like I had a lot to give to the situation, that they worked very closely with their mentors, Many of them talked about um, being able to have um, conversations with parents, also working with individual children in these contexts, doing a lot of planning. Um, and also many of the mentor teachers saying it was just wonderful to have the students there, that, um, you know, that it, it created a whole different um, space for them around the value of um, the pre-service teachers and these, and many of them, the young people who had a lot more, you know, technology skills, and so were able to help them um, build on that. So it's sort of, so to me, there was the potential and opportunities once once the fear and anxiety subsided and their everyday practice started to evolve. I think adaptions and changes um, happened very quickly. Um, and, and that wasn't just in Australia. There were a lot of experiences um, around the world. And Gloria, I remember you were talking to me about, you know, sort of some of this, the ways that learning um, from the lockdowns happened um, in other places as well. That's right. You know, in other countries, do you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and how, yeah, and, and certain people really um, suffering uh, with, you know, when um, parents right now, and there are huge challenges when parents are working at home and having to educate their children, you know, whilst while working and um, wanting to do the best that they can, but not always knowing what to do and and maybe not even having the educational qualifications to be to to be doing the work that they're doing. And I just want to reiterate what Karen said about um, curriculum and learning are not the same things as learning outside of the home and that we tend to value the curriculum more than all of the learning that occurs beyond school. And I think that's another thing that we we're trying to show in, in um, our book and not just in the covert times, but um, that, you know, we have a rural and remote placement, for example, and learning about community. And what I was saying um, to Karen is that um, Andrew Bunning, Bunning, Bunting, is Bunting, is it? Yeah, yeah. Bunting. Who Karen has worked with was talking about schools being, um, besides churches, schools are the most underutilized uh, buildings that there are. So they're used very, very little throughout the year in terms of time. And that the school, just like the child, is part of a much broader community. And we're not really showing that in schools. And he was suggesting that 
a school should be utilized 24 hours a day by different groups coming in and um, having evening classes or knitting or whatever they do so that it becomes a center of of a community rather than an isolated place. And I started thinking about how schools are really isolated from the rest of society. And that's partly about keeping people safe, I suppose. But it's really important that especially now and you know Karen didn't talk about the so well she talked a bit about the social side is that children need one another and when they and they show that they need one another by finding ways to do that and they were writing letters and delivering them to their friends they were exchanging books and dropping them off in mailboxes because we we need that social we are those social beings and the children were leading the way to say, I need this. And even though I'm supposed to be staying in my home, we'll ride our bikes over and we'll do this. And I think it says so much to educators about putting all children of the same age in one room for an entire year. It actually makes so little sense in so many ways when we know that in that same group of children, all the same age, that their abilities, their interests, their desires are vastly different. So um, it, it's, it's about that our book and our intention and our belief is about rethinking the things, as Karen said, that education is meant to be and meant to have. And I know that's a huge ask for all the people out there and for us, but I believe together we can create that change. Mm -hmm. Which sort of leads us in a very nice segue into the sort of final part of our discussion today, Gloria, which is really about, you know, what what's next? I mean, what did we learn from this? And can we learn from it and keep the, you know, keep the momentum going? Is there, is there evidence that, you know, I mean, the our Prime Minister often, you know, urging teachers, you know, to, to get back into schools and start again, because, you know, the children were going to miss out and they'll be behind and they'll, and I remember even in my own, um, leadership meetings with um, non-educators across the university, many of them saying, you know, this is going to be, have a huge travesty for young children who have missed out on all this learning during this time and how will they catch up and will they have enough time this year to make up for what they missed out on and, you know, and so that whole discourse around, um, you know, the implications of COVID, the implications of being in this alternative, you know, learning space and how it was going to disrupt children's, you know, uh, a, a possibility of moving forward, you know, by reaching the certain standards that they need to at certain classes and so forth. So it sort of started to creep back, didn't it? Once, <laughs> once we got over the, the lockdown, it, we creeped back into this idea, oh my gosh, we need to get them back in the classroom and get them going again and, and, and start, you know, filling them up with all the stuff that they missed out on to make sure that they, you know. Um, so that's a really interesting question. I think that's how it started. I think that in this sort of myth of catching up has actually um, started to open up a whole revolution around conversations around schooling now. So. I'm just wondering, Gloria, if you want to talk a little bit that because I remember, I, you know, you were saying you were sort of looking a little bit about what what catching up means um, yes. during this time. That's right. Uh, about um, the discourse, as Karen said, is about falling behind. I wrote down some of the words from the news mm -hmm. and from um, people's mouths. Um, falling, catching up, at risk, school failure, year 12s with an uncertain future. And you know, we're, we're re-looking we're re at ATAR. I mean, again, a possibility, but, and Swinburne's looking at that, Karen's university, about is that the best way to determine 
whether a person gets into a particular course at university and what are other means of, of doing that. Um, their NAPLAN couldn't go through. So what the, they're re-examining NAPLAN, which is a fantastic idea. <laughs> and um, so again, possibilities arising. But um, a couple of initiatives that I wanted to mention to you that I think are exciting are, there's an Australian learning uh, lecture and uh, it's a lecture series in education and each lecture series, each lecture is a catalyst for two years of implementation that's going on in, in Australia. And as well, um, in the, a lot of work is happening in the UK and they're, um, they've got um, a program where they're implementing things in schools of change, radical change, and then creating case studies with those. And so I'm absolutely delighted to give you the um, websites for these, um, these particular groups. But lots is happening and it's happening in conversation. And I really believe that through creating a new discourse, a discourse of possibilities rather than of um, what, what students are lacking. Um, mm -hmm. we, can, we can change things, Karen. Yeah, so I suppose, it, and, it, and, and we need to ask the question, what did they learn that was different? You know, uh, you know they spent you know, months in isolation with their families, um, with limited connections to other children, but, but their family group uh, became a very, you know, central part of their lives. Uh, they probably saw more of their, their you know, um, their parents than, or their carers than they would have in normal circumstances. They, they didn't play lots of tennis and dance and all those other things they had to think of different ways to entertain themselves. They didn't even have playgrounds to play in, you know, a lot of the time. So, you know, what happened in those spaces? Um, I, I do agree though, like talking to my granddaughter, she talked a lot about missing um, her friends. You know, I, I miss my friends a lot. And she kept asking me, when are they going to open up the playgrounds maybe, you know? Um, and, and, and even though we acknowledge that, you know, it's, it's patchy, it's different, you know, everyone's children have experienced lots of, lots of um, difficult times and challenging times, some of them have had positive times, but I know there was a survey that was done in the UK where they looked at, um, you know, how home learning um, felt for parents and many of the parents said that they, they felt their children had made remarkable progress advancing reading levels, improving their speech, growing up in confidence. Many of them talked about their children's self-esteem growing because they could work at their own pace. They didn't have the pressure cooker feeling of being compared constantly with their peers in the classrooms. The fear of failure. Maybe parents um, were less concerned with timetables, you know, so lunch came when it felt like it. It was much more relaxed around that. And I think particularly for younger children, maybe it showed that schooling routines and habits um, really are quite troubling for many children. They, they still struggle with that um, even, you know, as they go up through the schools. And I, I think, you know, the rethinking of schools in terms of spaces you know, as you said, with Andrew Bunting, who did some amazing stuff around how you could rethink the architecture of schools. Um, I think we should also be thinking about um, the architecture of schools in terms of those habits that we have around what we think is appropriate in terms of classrooms, you know. Um, June 26th, so not so long ago, there was some headlines in a local paper about a school in Eltham where the, the deputy there had said um, they asked the students when they came back, it was a secondary school, and they, uh, uh, an all girls secondary school, asked the girls to talk about the things that they'd like um, changed um, from their experiences of COVID. And most of them said that they wanted, um, they wanted shorter classes, less work. Um, they wanted an opportunity to spend more time with each other. They wanted a new timetable that allowed more rests and more breaks between their learning. Um, 
And the principal said that, you know, that many of them said that they felt like they were doing better because they had less assessments, um, they were feeling more confident that they could, um, if they had more time to think about things more deeply, so they, they you know, they would uh, explore, you know, things which we talked about in the in the earlier books, this idea of, you know, instead of learning a lot of knowledge around here, actually digging deep into ideas, you know, having chance to really think through big ideas. Um, and so that school in particular has been thinking about, you know, redo, reconstructing or renewing their, you know, their ideas um, to more student-centered approaches by having these conversations. But there was also um, a survey that's been been out um, in primary and secondary in some of the independent schools, and many of um, many of the, the outcomes of that students have also said the same things that um, that being able to have access to technology, to use technology in different ways, um, and being able to um, provide ways of recommending how children might um, manage their own time and then and themselves in their learning in a much more student-centered way, which again, are things that we've always talked about in our Learning to Teach book around you know, how important it is to listen to children and understand the world that, that they live in um, to think about how learning might be um, responsive to their needs. So I'm sort of excited, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited a around what those possibilities might be. And, and I'm excited also because I think in light of, um, you know, the Greta Thunberg going back to the beginning of this conversation where, where young people were starting to really, I think, generate some momentum around having a voice and seeing that they could um, talk to adults in schools and their families around what what their needs are and that was starting to be taken seriously that this you know this post covid environment provides an opportunity for that you know ongoing conversation to keep happening and I'm and I hope that the children are listened to because I think they know they're learning now and I think parents also probably understand children's learning better now and um, and and it should be around that shared conversation um, I think that's true, Karen, um, all that you said. Uh, I think what we'll do now is read a little, just a little passage each from the text. Yeah, uh, okay, let's do that. Let's do let's that. Finish off. Okay. So I'll start in. And one of the voices, I said it was a multi-voice text, and one of the voices I gave at the very end of the text was to school. So I wanted school to talk about its factory existence. And I'll just read a little portion of that. I'm no longer fit for purpose. I've become more of a gated community with strict and enforced rules and procedures. My outer shell remains, but cracks appear as further structural upgrades are undertaken inside and outside in an attempt to improve me. Recently, some of my cracks were made by young people who rose up in resistance and battered my walls because of their treatment within. They shouted chants and held signs that read that they were not being prepared for the challenges ahead. They rose up and continued to rise up to fight for nature. Their fear, along with their outrage, bring with them new challenges for teachers. Karen? Yeah, and I'm going to um, finish by talking about the idea of the murmuration and um, and I think we're going to show an image. Um, this is an image of an installation by Chinese artist Chao Ching Qing. If you manage to get to the um, National Gallery and see this. Um, and the idea of the murmuration is something that I picked up and followed through in the book. Um, scientists believe murmurations are similar to other ecological systems such as avalanches, metals becoming magnetised and liquids turning to gas. That is that these systems are always on the edge of about to be something and it's that instant of transformation that allows them to turn into something new. So the quote from the book 
um, is around the notion of the murmuration. And you'll, if when you get the book, and I know you're going to get it, um, the cover actually is a sort of a, a metaphor of that notion of the murmuration. And in the book, I, I'm speaking to the pre-service teacher, and I say, you will be invited to continually return and turn over, just like a murmuration being in the act of murmuring with big ideas as you engage with the book. So you as a learner and a teacher, like a flock of starlings responding to a subtle change in direction in a murmuration, that you can be constantly gliding, reaching and shaping the world in which you are being in and knowing. Just to finish off, you know, whether educators and education per, per se can respond to these challenges and consider new and innovative ways forward will in respect, many respects be dependent on how open and responsive we, they, you are to the challenges of living in a precarious and uncertain world. And certainly COVID has brought that to our attention, how quickly the world can change um, for us. In the book I write, for some educating in this messy, disorderly world, it could mean new openings, new possibilities, being innovative. And I'm sure, I really think that we've seen this. But it could also be, be unraveling and frightening and scary. It may be a combination of all those things, but it is, as Gloria said in the very beginning, in this space of discomfort, this point on the edge of the murmuration, which this possibility for a new journey, a new discovery could take us. There is no certainty and actually uncertainty is starting to become you know, an everyday part of our world. You'll need to be knowledgeable about children, I, I write, and young people and the world that they live in. That is, take time to listen to what they have to say, watch what they do, engage with the tools of knowing that they value. So just to finish the webinar, uh, I pose two questions and um, I pose them to all of us um, and the profession um, and those two questions, and I've actually posed these two questions to my staff as well at the university when we go back to thinking about what learning for us will be um, in, in 2021. I said, what did we have before we can now leave behind? And, I, and the final one is, what do we have now in this COVID context that we want to take with us into the future. So from Gloria and I, we'd like to thank you so much for being part of the webinar. And I hope there were some interesting ideas that might have provocated some thinking. Um, and we look forward to you uh, responding to us um, maybe through, you know, once you uh, get a chance to look through the book and look through some of the things that we've explored in this third edition. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Gloria and Karen. That was absolutely interesting and fantastic. Um, there are a couple of questions, but we can deal with them by email afterwards, seeing as we're coming close to time. And I'll pass back to Shannon. Thanks again. Thanks, Geraldine. Thank you, Gloria and Karen. It was such an insightful session. Um, so to all our participants, thank you. And if you do have any questions, um, please feel free to email them through to the email on the screen that you can see now. And just remember the new edition of Learn Teach has just been published and it's also available as a print ebook or a six month ebook option. Um, if you do decide to prescribe this text for your course, it does come with a wealth of lecture resources. And you can find out more by visiting the book page on our website. I'll be in touch over email, but um, please don't hesitate to contact me if you have any other questions on this or any other Oxford textbooks. Thank you for attending and to our authors on a fantastic presentation and have a good rest of your evening. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.